Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. This week, Senate Finance Chair John Marty talks about the budget surplus, sports betting, and more. And the Education Finance Committee's top Republican, Jason Rarick, offers his plan to keep Minnesota's school budgets in the black. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Chairing the Senate Finance Committee is one of the most powerful positions in the Senate. Any bill with a fiscal impact must get final approval from the committee, and the chair ultimately decides which bills to consider. Joining me now to talk about the budget, sports, betting, and more is the current Senate Finance Chair, Senator John Marty. Thank you for being here. Glad to be with you. Let's start with last week's budget forecast, which set the stage for any spending that will occur during this session. The state is projected to end the biennium with a budget surplus of $3.7 billion, but there is an asterisk uh, because spending is expected to exceed revenue in the next biennium and budget officials are calling this a structural imbalance. How are you viewing this latest report? Sure, I think the way you summarized it's just right. There's money, one-time money in the bank, but then we've got to watch it because we had a big structural imbalance this last biennium because imbalance means that you're taking in less money than you're spending. And we, the only way you can use up a surplus is to have a structural imbalance. So we had a big structural imbalance here because we had a huge one-time pot of money last time. We were using it wisely in one-term investments and so on. In the next biennium, overall spending is supposed to go down from this biennium. We're expecting it to go down, we're planning on it, but even so there's still a partial structural imbalance. So we wanna make sure we have enough money to cover that because a structural imbalance makes sense when you're trying to spend the money that you've got in the bank but it doesn't make sense on and on and on because you can't do that. You have deficits and we don't want to have a deficit. So what I'd say to people is it's good news. The economy is doing well, better than we expected a few months ago. It's doing well, but that's not a green light for doing all sorts of things. We made huge investments in people and education and health care and housing and so on last year. Let's continue what we've been doing, but let's be careful with this new money to make sure we have enough to cover in the future as we ramp down to sustainable budget budgets on a long-term basis. So my next question was about one-term or one-time spending versus ongoing spending. For example, then, there has been a request for $120 million for EMS and ambulance services. Would that be a good use of the money and not, say, expanding the farm to school programs that would be an ongoing expense into the future? We have very virtually no capacity to do ongoing spending right now. And we don't have that much to use for the one time either because we do need to save most of that along the way. So, so on my pitch would be yes, among those two choices, you could use something that's one-time investments, you could not do ongoing spending. And that's what we're gonna have to struggle with because the needs, housing alone has needs far greater than we have money for. Capital investments, um, we have, the state's been behind in that. Our infrastructure's gone down, we were building it up, huge investment last year. We wanna keep doing that, but there's very little, and everybody thinks there's about five times as much as there really is. So one proposal that I know the House is interested in would be an example of ongoing spending, and that is expanding Minnesota Care to include a public option. Minnesota Care is a health care program for low-income Minnesotans. Uh, there's a recent report on this proposal from the Department of Commerce that estimated it would be anywhere from 86 million to 364 million annually, depending on how it is set up. So considering these budget numbers, is this something that the state can afford? I would say you, we can't do the ongoing spending right now, so that's not something we could do that way. And, and I'm not sure, I mean, I, I want to have, I think everybody deserves health care. I want to make sure everybody gets health care. This is one that would take a small set of the public, about 3% of the public, and give them a chance to get much better quality health care. But um, I think that, um, I don't think that's likely this year because of, because of the need for ongoing money, and I'm not sure that's the best direction to go anyway in terms of getting to what I want to see where, where health care is a right, like education is. 
A kid doesn't have to qualify to go to school. They don't have to have their parents have the right school insurance program. They don't have to worry about co-pays and deductibles. We want every kid to get educated. I want to make sure we have every person have a right to get health care. So that's what I'm aiming for. The public option would cover more people, but again, it is very expensive, and that's why I'm not sure it's going to go anywhere. Well, let's talk just a little bit more about the universal health care model, because you wrote a book about it. You have been advocating for this for a long time. How could the state afford to move to a plan where everyone has health care, where it is a right, mm -hmm. considering our current state fiscal sure. environment? Sure. And the way I'll respond to that is by saying that, ironically, for the last 40 years, every time we've tried to do in reducing spending um, on health care, Everything we've done for the health care reform has been reduced spending, so make it harder to get. Put all these obstacles in all this administrative costs. We've been doing it as a nation for 40 years. We now have done a good job at making sure people don't get too much health care. Matter of fact, 40% of Minnesotans report they delayed or denied themselves health care because they couldn't afford it in any year. And yet we have, we're spending twice what anybody else in the world spends on health care, with very few exceptions. And so I'm arguing, let's stop all these barriers to care, because ironically, I, my Minnesota health plan proposal is one that would have the best care availability anywhere in the world. And my argument is by having a health care system that is designed to provide health care, not designed to save money, ironically, I think you save money. Through the elimination of bureaucracy, through reasonable pricing and so on, I think that's what we're aiming for. And we actually got a, fund, a study funded last year, a couple million dollars to compare a universal health care system with what we're doing now, see how much it costs, but mainly how does it do to take care of people, keep them healthier so they can go to work and take care of their families. Since 2015, there have been proposals offered by both DFLers and Republicans to legalize sports betting in Minnesota. 38 states and the District of Columbia have done so, including all the states that border Minnesota. Uh, in a statement, you said, quote, there has been significant debate over who should profit from sports betting. However, there has been far too little debate about the human and societal costs that would result from the largest expansion of gambling in Minnesota history. What would it take for the bill to receive your approval? Sure. First of all, I think adults should be allowed to gamble. I'm kind of libertarian that way. Let people gamble if they want to, if they're adults. My concern is not, and anybody can. You can bet with your friends. You look around during March Madness, you look at all the office pools and everything else. You should be able to bet with friends, strangers, anybody. My one concern is when you have a predatory business coming in there and marketing to you and pushing you to do this and driving you, it has tripled the number of calls to um, gambling hotlines and so on in Ohio and New Jersey and other states. And when you have sports betting on your phone, you just pull out your phone any time of day or night and can bet unlimited stuff. It's highly addictive. And to me, if we're going to address this, we got to recognize that we are causing a public health crisis here. Gambling addiction is just as powerful as opioid addiction or anything else. And for suicide rates, it's worse than any other kind because if the people who've been in treatment, roughly half of them have considered suicide and one in six has actually tried it. So if we're going to allow this, allow the predatory businesses to come in and sell to people, not, not people betting on their own, but somebody coming in to push it, we've got to have all kinds of restrictions on it to make sure we're keeping people from addiction. Uh, the cost to the state is, is looking over the state budget. I keep seeing huge increases. We don't fund mental health and substance use and addiction stuff. We don't fund that nearly well enough. And that's why our prisons are filled with people with these challenges. If we're going to do this, we got to make sure the state is protected so that they don't come in, make money off our folks, and then take the money and run. And we're stuck with a big health care crisis. We only have moments left, but I do want to ask you this last question, because you are chief author of a bill that would prohibit food stores and retail establishments from refusing to accept cash. I googled cashless society and was treated to an array of options, both pros and cons, for why you know we should or should not do this. What is the impetus? There's some of the folks who represent low-income workers, some of the unions and others have said, you know, a lot of their people, it's hard for people. A lot of, not everybody uses credit cards. And as we go, our society is based on our federal government mints money. 
and it's supposed to be doing it, that's what we're supposed to be using. There are all kinds of alternatives. We want to make sure people have access to that. But for a lot of low-income people who use cash, a lot of older people who use cash, let's keep that as an option for people. Senator John Marty, always a pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. Republican lawmakers called a press conference to propose changes to the new state emblem and to advocate for a statewide vote on the new Minnesota flag. We have 13 members, 13 unelected members, spoke for 5.7 million people, for 3.5 million voters. 13 members designed what is before us and about to become if the legislature doesn't act, the next flag and seal of Minnesota. We are advocating for nothing more than the right of Minnesotans to vote on what represents them. That's the question, and that's what these bills are designed to do. The seal uh, incorporates a non-official state emblem. Uh, it was added by the commission, uh, Minnesota Makoche, which is not the state motto. The other issue with the seal is that the date has been removed, and there are two bills that are going to be introduced. One, to remove the phrase that isn't allowed by statute, and one to add the state, uh, the year of statehood back into the seal. If dismissing the voice of the people were not bad enough, the fiscal irresponsibility of the Democrat majority is now going to be borne by local communities across the state as they have to make changes to different emblems, badges in law enforcement agencies, again, across the state. And DFL lawmakers and outlined the need for reforms to the prior authorization process. Prior authorization is not a new issue or a new challenge. It's a tool used by insurers uh, and pharmacy benefit managers to pre-approve medications or treatments that they will cover. The reason we're here and the reason we have introduced this bill is because the requirements for prior authorization have grown and have gotten out of control. Prior authorization is being used for medications and treatments that we want to encourage patients to get, but the process is a barrier to those patients getting the care they need. This bill simply says that prior authorization should not be used for preventative services or for services where a delay in care could harm the patient. As a legislator, I think this bill is good public policy designed to ensure patients get the care they need in a timely manner without administrative barriers or dangerous delays. And as a physician, this is personal because I've seen the prior authorization process delay care and even cause patients to abandon care. And because I've seen my colleagues suffering from burnout caused by never ending interference in their ability to care for their patients. The plan's own numbers internally suggest that 85 to 95 percent of everything in this bill is covered care. That we are deliberately withholding care and creating barriers, speed bumps in the road for patients getting access to that care. And it should be noted that in that remaining 5 percent that are not approved on the first, or the first round, that of those a good percentage of those simply give up. They don't get the care they need because they aren't willing to keep fighting. The things that we're really looking forward to are reducing prior authorization on substance use disorder treatments, on chronic illnesses like diabetes, on outpatient mental health care, on cancer treatment. Um, health care is complicated enough without unnecessary prior authorization. Despite substantive investments in E-12 education by the legislature during 2023's budget setting session, some school districts are facing budget shortfalls. Senate Republicans are calling for the removal of mandates so that districts can choose for themselves how to best serve their students. Senator Jason Rarick, lead Republican of the Education Finance Committee, joins me to talk more about it. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. 
Minnesota Public Radio reported on Monday that more than 70% of school districts in the Twin Cities, Rochester, and Duluth are expecting budget shortfalls. Is this just urban schools or are all schools facing potential budget shortfalls? Yeah, this is all schools across Minnesota. Um, I've been talking with superintendents and school boards uh, from my district and around the state, and they're all um, saying that th even though new funding was made available, um, a lot of the things that they're required to do now eat away at that and they're, they're just not going to be able to make ends meet. So um, a lot of schools are looking at uh, making cuts even though there was record funding. Um, and that was talked about, they presented that a, a lot last year as the proposals were coming forward. And I think they were hoping um, the money would be there, um, but some of, the, some of the new requirements would fall away. Uh, unfortunately, they, most all of those requirements uh, followed through as well. So they're, they're struggling, they, they really are. Well, let's dig into those numbers a little bit because per pupil funding, for education was increased by $700 million in the last session. So that's a 4% increase for fiscal year 2024 and 2% for 2025. The entire education funding package came in at 2.3 billion. So as you said, there was significant dollars. If Republicans had been in charge of the budget last session, how would it have looked differently? Yeah, we had a proposal that we offered um, that would have been five and five on the formula and fully funding the special education cross subsidy. Those are the two big things that schools tell us that gives them the most flexibility um, for their general fund dollars to do what they need. Um, and we had a little bit uh, with the 2.2 billion that would have been left over for some school safety aid and some other um, smaller amounts to, to help schools out in particular areas of, of need around long-term maintenance and things like that. But the five and five on the formula and the fully funding special education cross subsidy were our real uh, focuses um, and then not doing any new requirements on them around curriculum or, or, or anything else. L allowing schools to kind of recover uh, and get their feet under them coming out of COVID, um, th they're really trying to get settled from that and so to put all kinds of new curriculum requirements and, and other requirements on them is just a, a, an extra burden that they didn't need right now and, and so that would have been the difference if Republicans had control. The DFL budget included universal free breakfast and lunch, free menstrual products, a supply of naloxone to reverse opioid overdose, and unemployment insurance for seasonal positions like bus drivers and paras, just to name some of the bigger ticket items. Are these among some of the mandates that you would like to see reversed or is, and is it for all districts reversed or just some or let districts choose or what is the approach? Yeah, so we're working on a proposal right now. We've been talking uh, with folks just how to make this work. Um, but I th the basis of our proposal is going to be to allow for th the next three years that school boards would look at the different uh, requirements and say, you know what, we're going to put this one on hold for three years. Um, and basically any of the, the requirements that came through um, on the K-12 bill and we're looking at others. We know the paid family leave and earn sick and safe time will not be able to be a part of that. But especially the ones that had funding tied to them that the school district could say, we're going to wait until 2028 to have this take effect. And then they can redirect the money to where their specific needs are. Um, so that's a proposal that we're looking at and trying to figure out how to word it uh, so it is done correctly. But I think a lot of school boards, um, even if some of these ideas are things that they believe they can do, the time frame that was put in place for them is going to be very tough for them to manage. So that's why we're looking at the three year window. And then as a legislature, we can evaluate and say, some school districts did it, some opted out. What are maybe some of the things we can look at in future uh, years to change or pull back on. And so then does that flexibility also apply to the curriculum changes? You know, there was the push for literacy so that all kids learn to read and that's a new curriculum and costs money. There's requirements for civics, personal finance, Holocaust and genocide studies, and also ethnic studies. So would these also be included, like schools could have sort of a, a, a waiting period to before they implement these new curricula? Yeah, exactly, and that's, ex that's what we're looking at specifically. Um, 
These are smaller uh, amounts that are for the schools, but it's the time frame that was put in place that's probably the biggest factor, especially for our small rural schools. Some of these new curriculum, going to require some new teachers uh, with different training or current teachers to get the training to provide this. And the, the one year time frame on it was just not enough for them to be able to make these changes. So that's, that's the point of the three year window that we're looking at. And again, it would be a school board would have to take that vote. So it would be very uh, public as to um, why they're doing it. And again, not saying it's ending, but it's giving them uh, up to three years to, to implement it and make it happen. You mentioned the special education cross subsidy, and there is an increase from the state in funding that. There's also an increase in the um, English language cross subsidy, and those amounts are going to increase over time. So perhaps it's early days yet to, to see that impact. What are your views on, on the state's responsibility? Because schools have to fund those one way or another. Should the state be funding more on those cross subsidies? Yeah, again, our proposal last year fully funded that. Now, I believe that the federal government should be stepping up and meeting some of that need. They're the ones who mandated this. Um, but especially the small school districts are really struggling to make that uh, happen, and it's eating away at their general fund. And that, more than anything, would have been my priority to fund um, because it equally gets out to the schools depending on their need. Um, so the schools that have a lot of students in special education would get that funded and really help uh, free up their uh, general fund dollars to provide the other programming that you know, families expect. So um, you know, we could scale that back uh, at the state level if the federal government ever finally meets their obligations. Um, but I, I do believe that's one the state should be looking at fully funding for our schools um, because especially our smallest districts, if they get a couple of uh, students with high needs, it just blows their budgets. Uh, some are saying that the budget problems are not because of last session's budget, but rather because of the end of federal COVID-19 dollars or because it's a bargaining tactic as teacher contracts are being negotiated or because too many referendums failed last fall. Is, some, is there some truth to that? Um, there's a little bit of everything that goes into it. Um, there's no question about that. Um, I do think um, what our school districts are asking for is the, you know, the state funding to come without strings and that's what a lot of the things that we pass at the legislature, they're good ideas. They're, you know, you can explain why um, this would be good for kids. But yet I think we've overstepped on a number of areas, making it a statewide requirement. Um, and it really limits what our local schools can do. And I think we have to get back to this concept of trusting our local school boards, families and teachers to know their students, put the things in place that uh, is, would best benefit our kids. And then by doing that, um, we're allowing them to best use the dollars that are available to provide the needs for their kids and their families. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. And as legislators, we're the ones who are guilty of all of these new requirements that uh, may seem on the surface like great ideas, but let's, let's have the school boards talking about it and determining if that's what's best for their kids. Now, before I let you go, I have to ask you about one more thing. Uh, you have a bill that has raised some hackles on both sides of the aisle, your colleagues and, and the DFLers. You proposed an expansion of the Takanai Assistance Area to include new school districts if projects uh, get started in those areas. Why? Yeah, you know, that's the biggest thing that I think people have missed out on and understanding. Um, so we have the Talon Mine that is looking to begin operation um, and the biggest area that they'll operate in is McGregor School District and last year language was put in place that would add McGregor in so that when the mining operations start there they would be able to receive the, uh, the, assist, the taconite assistance money just like the schools up on the range do. Well I have schools um, in my district that 
will future in the future Talon will be expanding into their areas so I put a bill in mimicking the language um, from last year's legislation um, to say that when the mining begins within those school districts they would then join in so that they would be treated like all the other school districts that have mining going on within their areas um, and I just wanted to start that conversation and see where it would go I didn't expect it to be this contentious well we'll keep watching it Senator Jason Merrick, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. DFL lawmakers joined Attorney General Keith Ellison in calling for stricter guidelines to prevent employee misclassification fraud. But now we're seeing something that threatens that century-long effort to make the workplace a fair, hospitable, humane place to work. And what that is, is we're seeing some employers trying to cheat the system that keeps workers safe, healthy, and protected through what we call misclassification fraud. Now what that is, is when certain actors, I would say bad actors, label their legitimate employees as independent contractors just to escape things like worker, workers' compensation, unemployment compensation, and other things that go along with the job. Our current policy approach and the way that the statutes are, are, are designed to approach it in detecting, in preventing, and punishing misclassification fraud is not working the way it should. It's fractured, it's disjointed, and it doesn't give our agencies or Minnesota workers uh, the tools they need to face this huge problem. Employer misclassification fraud affects everyone. Um, it affects workers, business owners, and really our community at large. They're denying them overtime pay, uh, minimum wage, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, paid family medical leave, protections from discrimination, earned sick and safe time, and more. Uh, business owners are really hurt too. Business owners who follow the law and properly classify their workers struggle to compete with those who break the rules. And DFLers called for measures to enhance business competition and deter monopolistic business practices. Corporate monopolies dominate a variety of industries and use their consolidated market power to raise prices, lower wages, offshore jobs, squeeze small businesses, and shrink from their uh, um, responsibility to contribute to the common good. And in the last decade or so, it's only gotten worse. Across industries and geography, the economy is tilted in favor of wealthy and powerful corporate interests, and it's time for that to change. Think about the last time you bought something online. An airplane ticket, a hotel room, tickets to opening day for the twins, or a new phone. Was the price that you saw next to the item even close to the price that you ended up paying? Think about the last time you went out to dinner or ordered food online. How many different fees were added before your total? Corporations in Minnesota are employing underhanded tactics to hike prices on families already struggling to meet basic needs. Farmers deserve the freedom to operate their machinery and run their businesses as they choose, and not to wait on the companies they've already paid for their equipment from for continued access to basic services. On a personal note, this is my last Capital Report program. It has been my great pleasure over the past eight years to bring you conversations with lawmakers and others about important issues affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.